So the story I'm going to tell you is uh, something that unfolded over the last several years, and it has led to this uh, platform that is based on uh, past data on polymers. And, and this, uh, this capability is, uh, is currently being used, can be used to design uh, new polymers and also to predict the properties of uh, polymers. So that's the story uh, I'm going to tell you. Um, before we get started, let me uh, move on to the next slide, which shows uh, a few examples of why polymers are uh, important. At the beginning of this uh, uh, session, uh, Dr. Green uh, mentioned that uh, you know we evolved from the Stone Age to the Bronze Age to the Iron Age, and it's hard to define what the present age is. Some people say it's the Silicon Age because we are surrounded by electronics. Some people say it's the polymer age because we are surrounded by polymers. Um, so uh, regardless of what age we are in, um, we have to admit that there are there is a lot of polymers around us in many different applications. And what you see here are three classic applications. First one deals with energy storage. So if you're driving a electric car or a hybrid car, uh, you're probably using a big capacitor bank which uses uh, a lot of polymers in it to store electrical electrostatic uh, energy. Um, now, there are three applications over there. One of them is uh, energy storage, and the second one is uh, also a different kind of energy storage, batteries. And the third one is uh, electronics, organic electronics or flexible electronics. Now, depending on which application you may be interested in, um, the requirements of the properties of the polymers will vary. For example, if you take the first application, electrostatic capacitive energy storage for electric vehicles, um, you need polymers with a large band gap. I mean, if you're not uh, familiar with this quantity called the band gap, uh, it's essentially a measure of how good an insulator the material is. Larger the band gap, the better the insulator. Um, so that's one of the important properties property requirements for that application. Another one is high dielectric constant, which is a measure of how well this insulator can screen or shield electric field. Uh, so you see high band gap and high dielectric constant are requirements for that application. And it turns out that these two properties are conversely related, meaning typically a material with a high band gap will also have a low dielectric constant. If you go to the second application, there is a, you know there some other set of required materials properties. Um, for example, for batteries, um, low glass transition temperature, that's the temperature below which the material would look, be brittle and above which it would be rubbery. Uh, and, and you know that low glass transition temperature is a requirement because you want ions to shuttle through in this battery material. But then if the, uh, the material also needs to be, uh, needs to have a high strength, mechanical strength. So again, these two properties are contrarily related. The third application, you want low band gap because you want conduction uh, to be favored by this material. But then if you have a lot of charge carriers in it, you don't want them to recombine. So low carrier recombination is required. So anyway, depending on the application, you have different property requirements and it's highly non-trivial to choose a material, choose a polymer that would suit the need. Now, the reason I say it's non-trivial is, uh, is because the polymer chemical space is, is staggering. It's, uh, it's, it's really mind-boggling. It's very, very rich and diverse. What you see here in the top part of this picture, this slide, is are really common polymers, linear polymers. This, this thing that you see over here, uh, the top uh, part of the slide, polyethylene, is the most common, the most widespread material polymer that you see out there. And it's made up of carbon and hydrogen, CH2 units, uh, attached to each other linearly, which is why it's called a linear polymer. And these other polymers to the right of polyethylene are variants of that. And then down below you have uh, aromatic uh, rings, homocyclic polymers, and then down below that you have heterocyclic polymers, and down below that you have a mixture of uh, linear and homocyclic or heterocyclic polymers. And then if you go down, if you pan down to the bottom left, you get to polymers that contain non-carbonaceous materials like silicon or germanium or even metals like tin or uh, rhenium, etc. So the polymer chemical space, be purely based on chemistry, is, is really very diverse and truly staggering. So 
the question is if we want if we have a particular application in mind and if we have certain property requirements for that particular application how are we going to search through sift through this chemical space and how are we going to choose the right material in an efficient and effective manner so that's the question right where do we start well in our particular case a long story short we we use uh, uh, available data uh, you know data that that we produce i am by training a computational material scientist i do various types of computations and the one type of computation that is my favorite my specialty is something called density functional theory which is a quantum mechanics based method that can be used to compute a variety of materials properties so we use computations to generate a lot of data that's what is shown in the top left box computational data generated using high throughput density functional theory or dft methods down below that are you know is a box that that indicates experimental data so now it turns out that dft or quantum mechanics based methods are while while they are very powerful and versatile they also have their limitations not all properties for realistic materials are computable in a practical time frame using these methods so for in, in such situations we use experimental data data that we collect from our collaborators and i have a lot of experimental collaborators and data that we collect from the literature or from data collections like handbooks and repositories and so forth right and we have our own repository as well for polymers so we use a combination of computational data and experimental data as a starting point and uh, in the last few years we have been focusing our attention on properties such as the band gap dielectric constant glass transition temperature etc and the picture that you see the colorful picture that you see on the right is really a, a two dimensional scaled uh, representation of the variety of polymer data that we have polymers that we have accumulated in our database about 900 or so is what i'm showing here but this this slide is sort of outdated we have several thousand polymers for which we have a, a number of different properties that's what is uh, i'm trying to represent the spread the diversity of polymers that we have in our data set using this picture okay now let's say we have the data to begin with now what do we do you know with that so let me let me explain in a very simplistic manner what we do with it let us say we have data in this particular format right a number of materials a number of polymers from 1 through n for which we have property values p1 through pn this is something we believe let's assume that we already have now given this data set and this data set alone we would like to answer this question right for a new material material x what is the property value now, is this answerable is the question right uh, and of course if, if the answer was a clear no i wouldn't be giving you this presentation uh, it turns out that under certain circumstances and, and professor home already touched upon some of those circumstances already uh, you know, under certain circumstances it turns out that uh, this answer can be answered in the positive in the affirmative right so in such cases what we do need to do is convert these materials material labels label material 1 through material n to a number of uh, to 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 what we call as fingerprints uh, these are numerical representations uh, of each of the materials right these are also called as descriptors these are key properties descriptors features that represent the material in a numerical manner and then that is the step that we call as the fingerprinting step and once we accomplish that fingerprinting step we can establish a mapping between those vectorial fingerprints and the property and that that is the process that we really call as learning you can call it machine learning you could call it statistical learning but that is really the learning process right uh, and and of course uh, really the first step the fingerprinting step requires a fair amount of domain expertise i would say and the learning step is largely numerical in nature right so if we are able to achieve the learning process then we have a functional form that connects the fingerprint vectors to the property values and once we have that connection mapped out we can now answer that question we originally wanted to answer what is the property of material x right so this is the idea this is the basic idea and as i said the key challenge here is the fingerprinting right how do we go about representing our polymers uh, numerically we have come up with a scheme uh, we call it the abc scheme uh, at the very basic level uh, uh, we represent our polymers at, at the atomic level a level uh, we consider a variety of fragments like the ones i represent in the box on the left uh, we have a library we have a catalog of such fragments that can occur in polymers 
and we kind of count how many such fragments occur uh, occur in a given polymer that's the a level fingerprinting and then the b level actually uh, goes to a higher length scale you know what sort of uh, higher level blocks do we have ch2 blocks or c6h4 blocks etc that's the b level and then the c level is even higher in length scale uh, now it goes to the morphological chain level or microstructure of the polymer how many side branches do we have um, how long are these branches how frequently do they occur etc right so now that's kind of how we fingerprint our polymer now at the end of this step every polymer has a numerical vectorial representation now if you recall i mentioned that after we fingerprint we need to establish this mapping between those vectorial fingerprints and the property of interest we use gaussian process regression dr holmes talked about deep learning and neural networks we do use those methods but for this particular problem that i'm discussing today we use gaussian process regression which is a fantastic it's a very elegant intuitive similarity based uh, uh, bayesian inference based algorithm uh, and you know the beauty of this is we are able to predict properties but we are also able to predict the uncertainties of the predicted properties um, again i don't have time to go into the details we can get into that at the question answer session uh, but essentially we use gaussian process regression to establish this mapping between fingerprints and properties now i mentioned earlier that uh, domain expertise is required to uh, create these fingerprints and i'm going to show you an example of uh, why the type of fingerprinting really matters um, here i'm taking the example of the glass transition temperature which is a complicated multi-scale property multi-scale behavior of of polymeric materials what happens at the atomic level is important, but also what happens at a higher length scale is important. So what you see in this in this slide here on the uh, let's look at a plot on the on the left side, uh, the left block. Uh, what you see here is really a parity plot of the predicted glass transition temperature versus the measured, the true, the ground truth, experimental glass transition temperature on the x-axis. Y-axis is the predicted, x-axis is the the true value. And, um, and 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 in the left part of the slide, the the plot actually includes fingerprints that in that contains only the atomic level, the A level uh, details, A level features, atomic fragment level features. And as you can see, you know we can do reasonably well, but there are you know there is a fair amount of disagreement between the predictions and the measured values. The RMSC is about 50 Kelvin or so for this example. Now, to the to the middle panel actually shows B B level uh, features added to the A level features, and then we go through the same process. Things improve a little bit, and to the far right, it's a C level, the higher morphological or chain level features built into the fingerprints as well. You can see that there is significant improvement, right? It's gone down to 34 Kelvin, the RMSC. But there is a there is a little price that we pay, and the price is that um, we. Um, uh, we have a, a huge dimensionality. The dimensionality of a problem is enormous because it has A plus B plus C level features. Now we use feature elimination. We use there are many many techniques, and we use a couple of those. In this particular example, we use this method called recursive feature elimination to knock out these features from the A plus B plus C features that are irrelevant to this particular property are not really strongly correlated to this particular property. And after we eliminate it, we get a very tight model with the RMSC of about 24 Kelvin, it turns out that this is also the experimental error bar on, on these measurements. So we have, we have, we believe we have a model now that can predict the glass transition temperature of polymers at an accuracy equivalent to that of the uncertainty of the experiments at the original place. Now, that was the example of glass transition temperature, but we have a number of other properties that for which we can, we have built models and, and here is the spread of those results band gap dielectric constant refractive index etc glass transition temperature is down below to the to the bottom left so we have a number of these properties now the question is we are able to make these predictions very very fast few seconds uh, for each property uh, in a regular desktop pc whereas the the actual computations or the actual experimental measurements can take weeks and it can cost money so that's the advantage of this machine learning way of predicting properties of materials now the question is, what is the real impact? You know, so what, right? So I'm going to show you very quickly a few examples of the outcomes or the impact of this work. Um, first, in, for the first uh, class of outcomes is just a pure insights. 
what you see in this plot are uh, you know several hundreds of thousands of polymers for which I've plotted the dielectric constant that is predicted using the machine learning algorithm versus the band gap also predicted using our machine learning algorithm. Um, we can use this sort of a, a plot for, for screening. As you can see, these two properties are inversely related. This is the entanglement I was mentioning earlier. And we can actually ask questions such as, what are, wh why, do, why does such an entanglement, why does, why does this sort of a inverse correlation exist in the first place? And, and if we want to pick out polymers from the sweet spot, moderate band gap versus moderate dielectric constant region, what are the polymers that, uh, what are the features that such polymers have? Can we use that as guidelines to make new polymer, right? So insights like that can emerge. The other sort of outcome that we, that we can get out of this approach is actual materials discovery. Uh, now I mentioned that we can screen using, uh, using our capability, that's what I showed in the previous slide. Now using that screening capability, we have been able to uh, create polymers that, uh, that, we, that have been made in the lab, validated, tested, et cetera. And what you see here in this, this picture, in the slide, are four pictures. The, the leftmost picture is a currently used material for energy storage applications. And the, the, and the three pictures you see on the right are materials that we have been able to develop as part of our program. Um, and, and, the, and the bottommost line with numbers, that's the energy density, that is a measure of performance. The current material has an energy density of five joules per cc, whereas, whereas these new materials that we have made have about two to three times that value. So it's very rewarding to see all of this work translated to actual materials realized in the lab. The third sort of example is a tool that we have been able to build, and this is called Polymer Genome. Uh, it's available at polymergenome.org, free, uh, freely accessible at the present time. Uh, and you know, um, you can actually query polymers, uh, draw, draw a polymer, uh, and actually um, um, query its, its properties online. So, so here is an example, a little video, that shows how one could go about building a polymer using our capability. Uh, so that's the repeat unit of the polymer. We use the star symbol to indicate that this is a repeat unit, and we, you know, we use, put stars at the head and tail. So that's the repeat unit. That's the smile string that represents this particular polymer. And then we hit predict, and uh, in, a, you know, in about a few seconds, 10 seconds or so, uh, we should be able to see the results, the, the, the machine learning predictions of a variety of properties for this particular polymer. Uh, so this is a, a tool that we would like our experimental colleagues to use to make go, no go decisions on whether it makes sense to make a polymer, whether it will have a certain property that they are interested in or not, uh, a certain attractive value for the property or not. Of course, there are challenges uh, and, and there are a lot of things to do. We have uh, barely scratched the surface on what can potentially be done. Uh, one of the challenges is data, right? I mean, we, we, we are at a point now when we, uh, our data set size for this particular problem is of the order of thousands. Uh, now, can we go be way beyond that? You know, how do we efficiently capture data? How do we handle uncertainty and reliability of data? That's a very, very big uh, challenge. And you know, how do we go on to other properties? How do we handle morphological complexity? You know, how do we handle blends? Of, polymers are mixed and additives are thrown in. How do we handle things of that nature? And how do we actually inverse, go backwards? Right now we can predict properties for a given polymer, but can we go backwards? You know, if, if, there, are, if there is a wish list of properties, can we identify 10 polymers that will have such, such properties or not? So there are several challenges and it's a very exciting time for these sorts of methods within material science. And I'm very happy to, uh, to share some of our work. And last but not least, I certainly would like to thank the people who actually did all this work over the last several years, few years. Some of them have moved on and others are still here with, uh, with me at Georgia Tech. And I also want to thank uh, the funding agencies, especially of the Office of Naval Research for, uh, for, uh, for supporting the lion's share of this work. And, more recently, Toyota and Colon and uh, the National Science Foundation have uh, begun to support our work. And thank you for your attention.